Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. And happy April Fool's Day, everyone. If I were really clever and could plan ahead, I'd have a hilarious April Fool's episode planned for you today. But alas, I don't. So you get what I've got today, which considering how my March went, it might not be much today. I'm going to keep things shorter uh, as this past month I've had a, a pretty good cold going on and lost my voice for about a week. It's coming back, but it's not quite at its strength where I would like it. Uh, so that's kind of pushed back some of my uh, planned podcasting. I'm glad to be back in your ears. And I've got a fun story for us today. Just one quick announcement here. If you are wanting to be a part of our Cozy Christmas Book Club, uh, we are in full swing right now. We are currently reading Darcy Hanna's uh, cozy mystery book called Murder at the Christmas Cookie Bake Off. It's part of the, the the Beacon Bake Shop mystery series. And I've had Darcy on the podcast in the past. Really enjoyed my interview with her. And I love this book so much. Um, it's one of my favorite cozy mystery series. And this book is probably one of my favorite cozy mysteries. And then um, coming up next, the next book we're going to read is called The Christmas Train, uh, I believe by David Balducci. That one I read once quite a long time ago, and I actually don't remember much what it's about. But um, that one has been voted on several times and didn't quite get to the number one spot. And every time it's been nominated. So I, I figure it might be time just to put this book out of its misery <laughs> and, and we'll read it. And we will start that book in see, March, April, I believe in May. Uh, so yes, in May, that will be our read for the month of May. Uh, and I'm looking forward to um, those who have been participating, leaving comments on our Facebook group page. Thank you so much for doing that. Appreciate it. All right, well, let's get to our story today. So the closest I could get to a April Fool's Christmas story it's a stretch it, only because it's just a humorous short story. It's called Christmas Afternoon by Robert Benchley. Robert Benchley lived from 1889 to 1945. He was an American humorist, best known for his work as a newspaper columnist and movie actor. And I certainly enjoyed the story I'm going to read for you today. It is, uh, like I mentioned, it's called Christmas Afternoon, and it's as he calls it, says, it's done in the manner, if not the spirit, of Dickens. So I think you will um, find out uh, what he means <laughs> as I read the story. Some of it will sound a little familiar to you. All right, well, as, as usual, I invite you to um, settle in here by the Christmas fire. And I will read to you Christmas Afternoon by Robert Benchley. What an afternoon. Mr. Gummidge said that, in his estimation, there never had been such an afternoon since the world began, a sentiment which was heartily endorsed by Mrs. Gummidge and all the little Gummidges, not to mention the relatives who had come over from Jersey for the day. In the first place, there was the ennui, and such ennui as it was, a heavy, overpowering ennui, such as results from a participation in eight courses of steaming, gravied food, topping off with salted nuts, which the little old spinster gummage from Oak Hill said she never knew when to stop eating, and true enough she didn't. A dragging, devitalizing ennui, which left its victims strewn about the living room in various attitudes of prostration, suggestive of those of the petrified occupants in a newly unearthed Pompeian dwelling an ennui which carried with it a retinue of yawns, snarls, and thinly veiled insults, and which ended in ruptures in the clan spirit serious enough to last throughout the glad new year. Then there were the toys, three and a quarter dozen toys to be divided among seven children. Surely enough, you or I might say, to satisfy the little tots. But that would be because we didn't know the tots. In came baby Luster Gummidge, Lillian's boy, dragging an electric grain elevator. 
which happened to be the only toy in the entire collection which appealed to little Norman, five-year-old son of Luther, who lived in Rahway. In came curly-headed Effie, in frantic and throaty disputation with Arthur Jr. over its possession of an articulated zebra. In came Everett, bearing a mechanical man which would no longer dance, owing to a previous forcible feeding by the baby of a marshmallow into its only available aperture. In came Von Lansby, teeth buried in the hand of little Ormond, which bore a popular but battered remnant of what had once been the proud false bosom of Hussar's uniform. In they all came one after another, some crying, some snapping, some pulling, some pushing, all appealing to their respective parents for aid in their intramural warfare. And the cigar smoke. Mrs. Gummidge said that she didn't mind the smoke from a good cigarette, but would they mind if she opened the windows for just a minute in order to clear the room of the heavy aroma of used cigars? Mr. Gummidge stoutly maintained that they were good cigars. His brother, George Gummidge, said that he, likewise, would say that they were, at which colloquial sally both the Gummidge brothers laughed testily, thereby breaking the laughter record for the afternoon. Aunt Libby, who lived with George, remarked from the dark corner of the room that it seemed just like Sunday to her. An amendment was offered to this statement by the cousin, who was in the insurance business, stating that it was worse than Sunday. Murmurings indicative of as hearty agreement with the sentiment as their lethargy would allow came from the other members of the family circle, causing Mr. Gummidge to suggest a walk in the air to settle their dinner. And then arose such a chorus of protestations as has seldom been heard. It was too cloudy to walk. It was too raw. It looked like snow. It looked like rain. Luther Gummidge said that he must be starting along home soon, anyway, bringing forth the acid query from Mrs. Gummidge as to whether or not he was bored. Lillian said that she felt a cold coming on, and added that something they had had for dinner must have been undercooked. And so it went back and forth, forth and back, up and down, and in and out, until Mr. Gummidge's suggestion of a walk in the air was reduced to a tattered impossibility, and the entire company glowed with ill feeling. In the meantime, we must not forget the children. No one else could. Aunt Libby said that she didn't think there was anything like children to make a Christmas, to which Uncle Ray, the one with the Masonic fob, said, No, thank God. Although Christmas is supposed to be the season of good cheer, you, or I for that matter, couldn't have told from listening to the little ones, but what it was the children's Armageddon season, when nature had decreed that only the fittest should survive in order that the race might be carried on by the strongest, the most predatory, and those possessing the best protective coloring. Although there were constant admonitions to Fonlinsby to let Ormond have that whistle now, it's his, and to Arthur Jr., not to be selfish, but to give the kitty car to Effie. She's smaller than you are. The net result was always that Fonlinsby kept the whistle, and Arthur Jr. rode in permanent, albeit disputed, possession of the kitty car. Oh, that we mortals should set ourselves up against the inscrutable workings of nature. Hello? A great deal of commotion. That was Uncle George stumbling over the electric train, which had early in the afternoon ceased to function and which had been left directly across the threshold. A great deal of crying. That was Arthur Jr. bewailing the destruction of his already useless train, about which he had forgotten until the present moment. A great deal of recrimination. That was Arthur Sr., and George fixing it up. And finally a great crashing. That was baby Lester, pulling over the tree on top of himself, necessitating the bringing to bear of all of Uncle Ray's knowledge of forestry to extricate him from the wreckage. And finally Mrs. Gummidge passed the Christmas candy around. Mr. Gummidge afterward admitted that this was a tactical error on the part of his spouse. I no more believe that Mrs. Gummidge thought they wanted that Christmas candy than I believe that she thought they wanted the cold turkey, what she later suggested. My opinion is that she wanted to drive them home. At any rate, that is what she succeeded in doing. Such cries as there were of, Ugh, don't let me see another thing to eat, and take it away. Then came hurried scramblings in the coat closet for overshoes. There were the rasping sounds made by cross parents when putting wraps on children. 
There were insincere exhortations to come and see us soon and to get together for lunch sometime. And finally, there were slammings of doors and the silence of utter exhaustion while Mrs. Gummidge went about picking up stray sheets of wrapping paper. And as Tiny Tim might say in speaking of Christmas afternoon as an institution, God help us, every one. The end. Short and sweet story today. Uh, I enjoyed that. It's, it's, it was pretty, it was funny. Doesn't it always seem chaotic at the holiday season when you've got family around and there's so much commotion going on, so many, you know, kids everywhere, toys everywhere. I, I laughed over um, the uncle tripping on the train and breaking it, even though it was already broken and, and the kid uh, crying because of it. You know, that just sounds like memories I've had in my past. Um, the story also reminded me of uh, the kitty car. I don't know if that was the kind that you could like sit in and pedal. I remember my at my grandma and grandpa's house, uh, who I talk about a lot. Um, we spent many Christmases there. They had one, um, like a, an old red metal pedal car that, you know, was kid size. You could sit in and my goodness, we would fight over whose turn it was to ride that. I, I loved it. It, it. I thought it was great fun. You could drive around their yard in it. I think back now, it's probably be worth a pretty penny at an antique market somewhere. But we you know we didn't think about that. We we only cared about having fun, playing with them, and um, wanting our our fair turn. Now, for me, Christmas afternoons, usually now as an adult with older kids. My Christmas afternoons are usually pretty, pretty decent. We've spent the morning opening presents and probably eating. Um, sometimes we'll have lunch, uh, the Christmas dinner early or later in the afternoon, depends on what it is. But a lot of times it involves reading your Christmas book, putting together your Christmas Lego set, resting. You know, we just really try to make it a day of rest and family time. It's a lot of fun. But maybe you like that chaos. If you do, you know, well, good for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm truly happy for you. But tell me, what Christmas afternoon traditions do you have? Are they as chaotic as the ones in the story? I had one exasperated friend tell me once that the best lights at Christmas are the taillights of the family cars leaving your house. <laughs> All right, well, that will um, do it for today. Um, as I said, just a shorter episode today. Um, just real quick coming up here, I think um, I'm hoping to have three episodes out in April, but we'll see what I can have time to do. I know in the next episode, I'll be talking about Christmas coffee and some of what I enjoy about that, as well as sharing a story with you that I came across I really enjoyed. So thank you for beginning this journey with me to Christmas of 2024. I don't know what that Christmas will look like, where we will be, what will be happening. But I hope to be here to provide you with cozy stories and fun conversations. Again, if you'd like to join the Cozy Christmas Book Club, it's absolutely free. Sign up instructions are in the show notes. Uh, also, I will be, if you would like to make a financial donation to the podcast, um, there are some links there. And I'll send you a Christmas card and bookmark uh, or sticker. And uh, so with that, as always, let's remember to honor Christmas in our heart and try to keep it all the year. Have a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>